Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the English broadcast of the Chinese LPL. I'm, of course, Alice. This is Papa Smithy, and we're straight into Champion Select. So much for King to work on this game. Seeding the Avenge in all lanes, being out-rotated. It was a real big, a strategic uh, hole in a lot of ways yeah. there for King. They need to try something different. I want to see more proactive lanes from them. They can't afford to be reactive against top teams. They need to show respect to a team like Snake and just fight for the mid game. Yeah, it's true. King actually banning away Ella's Annie. This is very interesting. Taking Rek'Sai off the board as well. Beast has been favoring that jungler when he hasn't been able to get his Jarvan slash Nunu. And even when Nunu's left up, he's not been picking that one away as a top priority. But Snake, they get the Callista again. Yeah, look, I mean, Crystal's looked excellent on that champion. I believe two times in a row. Hasn't got all the hold of Callista very often. Of course, Callista, a very common ban. But look what this opens up. We're actually going to see the Cassidy and, and potentially the Nar come through from King. I didn't even realize, but Cassidy making it to the second round of picks. Yeah, Cassidy not being the first pick. Actually prioritizing Callista over that Cassidy. Says and a lot I, about Snake, right? Well, I guess, I mean, alphabetically, at least in English, that's going to be coming first. But, I mean, you have to think that that's the only way that that champion out-prioritizes the Cassidy. And he has just gone off. And, I mean, I'm thinking about World Elite yesterday managing to take that game off Snake. They know how strong he is. But this is the second time in a row that King has shown no ambiguity about their picks. No sorts of... Uh dual roll picks coming through. We've got, we're locked in here. It's going to be Cassidy and mid. It's going to be Nar top. Now suddenly for Snake, you can start looking towards those counter matchups specifically for the mid lane. Yeah, but I mean, look at Barker. He's got no target bans apart from that Lissandra, which he showed fantastic prowess on. He can go to which either Sharima option he wants. Yeah, and Lissandra taking over. As you mentioned, it has to be Azir. That makes oh, the yeah. most sense in the matchup against Cassidy. You could really go against the lane matchup and take the Xerath for comp, but why not just pick up the Azir? He's not even going to need to rush there. Of course, both soul lanes already taken away. I just don't like the fact that King, they're just ignoring the whole flex pick meta that we're in right now and just locking in strong champions. Yeah, it's just they've been pigeonholed to the point where the pigeon doesn't even need to be picked. But they're pigeonholing themselves. That's kind of the questionable thing is they're, yeah. they're tipping their hands so early against a snake team that's been adaptive that can play so many different types of comp. Of course, favor the protect the, the crystal comp, but we already know there's going to be uh, crystal on this uh, Callista, of course, can go either the selfish DP single target DPS build that we've seen come out a bit more recently or just AOE people down like he did last game. Yeah, it is going to be the Morgana pick away here, and I thought that Flandre might be looking to take that one into the top lane. Assassin does, in the end, decide to go with that, and I think that's a very intelligent pick because Flandre, you have to think, probably wanted to go for something like that towards that top side if they are going to go for this particular comp. And with that Black Shield, I mean, there's not a whole lot already on the table here for Snake, especially towards the bottom side that can deal with that Black Shield in an efficient manner. You have to think the fact that they haven't locked in their jungler I mean, everything about the comp screams Vi. Vi to deal with Callista, Vi to close the distance, Vi is available. I think that's what they're kind of screaming from the top of their lungs, leaving their champion up. It's good against uh, the Azir as well, getting on top of that champion. Yeah. They've left it to last pick. You know, they didn't want the counter pick to necessarily come through, or even more peel, maybe even a protect the, fl uh, protect the crystal comp to come through. But I think it has to be Vi now that we see Azir and Maokai locked up. Yeah, and this is the classic snake double threat comp coming through now as well. The Azir there for so much consistent damage, and of course, Callista, yeah, pretty good at the old kill, uh, consistent damage as well, especially in an AoE with that hurricane that's been coming through. Liam now cycling through some interesting picks, and we'll see what MLXG does decide to go with in the jungle. He's got the option of almost anything that he likes, loves the Rengar, loves the Lee Sin, We'll see what does come through, of course. You know, Rek'Sai and Nidalee have been banned away, but MLXG's got a pretty decent champion pool as far as that jungle is concerned. Yeah, I was thinking the vibe, but Rengar, very similar in terms of intent, going to be trying to get on top of uh, Callista at every opportunity. Not quite as reliable, of course. You don't have the point-and-click assault and battery, but they need gap close because at the moment, they've only got two divers. It's only realistically going to be Cassidy and... Uh, Rengar that can get into the back line and get towards Crystal, but look at how strong this front line is. Leona, Jarvan, Maokai, a very tanky front line for Callista to hyper carry behind. Yeah, the thing is though, is Assassin gonna go off on this Cassidy from the mid lane as well? I mean, we know the fact that he can get poked out from range here by Azir. Azir's Sand Soldier is fantastic with their auto attacks early on, really able to dominate that lane. But if he gets through it, if he manages to, you know, utilize his Null Sphere and really get the pressure on, he could 
really take over this game again, sort of like Ninja did. Absolutely. Needs to start that regen. I want to see the flask come through and just try and get through. Of course, Azir is very strong at harassing short-range champions. Melee range is the Kassadin. So it's yeah. going to be a difficult matchup. And MLXG, can he get going on the Rengar? Rengar has certainly been up and down in the oh, LPL. Yeah. Insects Rengar, probably the best acid test. Sometimes he goes off, gets three Brutalizers and looks great, and sometimes he just dies instantly in the engage. Yeah, and uh, it's it's been definitely hit or miss there. But MLXG, I mean... He has been opting for this Rengar more often than not. And we'll see whether it's going to work out this time. And Ella versus Lamb. This is an exciting matchup, actually. Just, I mean, generally, support matchups not necessarily going to be screaming exciting to you. But when it is sort of a Morgana that doesn't have a very breakable black shield, it can be a huge component of that bottom lane. And with the Dark Binding plus Phosphorus Bomb combinations to come through, especially after a Sheen here for Corky, it could be huge. But let's get onto the Rift and see what happens. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen, with Snake taking on King for our second match of the day. Snake with a dominating game one, and we'll see whether they can continue that form moving into game two. Things looking a very a little bit different from our King lineup, though. Now with the Nah and Cassidy, two very strong picks. Yeah, absolutely, but not necessarily strong for Lane. Of course, Cassidy going to be on the back foot compared to Barker on the Azir early. At least they have pressure in the top lane. We expect Nah to be able to pressure Maokai and push him in. And again, in the bottom lane, it's a difficult matchup, this Corky versus uh, Crystal's Callista matchup. But it's an interesting one, just because, again, you want to get enough attack speed, enough movement speed to be able to uh, use the martial poise to get away from Corky's Phosphorus Bomb, but in early levels, the trades should be registering for Woosh, and Woosh, you know, he can't afford to see the lane to Crystal two games in a row, because we already saw how far off this Callista could pop in the first game. Yeah, it's true, and Sky actually went back to base here as well. See what that's for, whether there's going to be a lane swap to come in, but it looks like it's going to be Snake opting in for a two versus one. Going to be opting into the lane. So, of course, Maokai, he wants to set up and get a bit of experience. And if he can enter lane late, of course, he can go and get a full camp for himself if he so chooses. But, yeah, actually opting away from the 2v2. Showing a lot of respect to Wuxia's Corky, probably his strongest champion that he's showed us in the LPL. Yeah, it's true. And, I mean, Snake had an opportunity to start that Gromp if they wanted to, but not going to here as we're going to see sort of Crystal dip away and chuck a Sentinel into their own jungle, just make sure that that blue buff is not going to be stolen away. And his use of these Sentinels has been great so far. I mean, you can use the Sentinel. You can skill it at level 1, not lose out a lot, because you get a lot of damage if you're with your support and just dueling down those minions, and you get the kill credit, whatever happens. So you're free to take it up. It gives you that extra vision, and it's a good first level choice for Callista. Yeah, Barker, of course, only has one first level choice. That Arise has to be coming through. And we'll see, has hit that level 2 mark, and that's when he can really start getting the pressure onto Assassin. You can see he's focusing more on pushing out this wave. And of course, Kassadin's sort of not known for being able to farm that fantastically under turret, but now with that W doing a whole lot more work, that could be an option as the duo junglers, Sky still level 1, they're going to look to put some pressure onto Barker. They have the ward over. Launches over the wall. Does MLXG. Barker going down so incredibly low. And he's going to die instantly. Beautiful play from King to start this one off. And King throwing their own curveball with excellent early pressure. I love the fact that they respected how strong the level 2 is from Rengar. The red buff hitting the bowler. It locked down Barker for a long time. He didn't even use his summoners. That's how much he respected the trade coming through. So at least he's able to lane as normal. He has his summoners up. MLXG now looking to transfer the pressure here to this bottom side as well as Ella hanging around here trying to get some wards down. Sort of the pseudo 2v2 here on the bottom side with Flandre on this Maokai here as well. And we've seen this one working out Quite well, actually, for a, you know, a Maokai and support matchup, but it's generally with a ranged support. Absolutely. So with the lack of a ranged support here, it has less lane control than most Maokai lanes, but Maokai has so much ranged clear and can actually push out lanes in a 1v2, or in this case a 2v2 against a double range matchup so well, that he's going to absolutely be able to keep up in CS. He's going to definitely find more easy CS than Nar, though Nar still roaming, hasn't actually grouped and entered lane at all at this point. And yeah, they're, they're going to have the Nar continue to roam. Still level 1. Yeah, actually, does get level 2 from this Gromp here as MLXG is going to be able to at least lock that one down for him. You can see Beast is just 
had his way with the jungle, just hanging out on his own, still able just to clear his camps pretty safely. But Assassin now didn't actually get an assist in that first trade. Is that a big deal here for this Cassander who wants to be able to weather this storm a little bit easier? I mean, it would be ideal. Of course, it gets him towards his Rod of Ages quicker. But in general, he's having pressure relieved from him. Of course, he would have preferred if Barker had used some of his summoner spells. So he would have to play even more defensively in mid lane. But with summoners up, he's done the very smart regen heavy start. Still has plenty of uh, charges of his flask and some potions available. So doing very well despite the melee, uh, the, the ability for Barker to abuse melee champions on this Zia. Yeah, Assassin actually farming out very well. Barker missing a few creeps there in the earlier stages. Hasn't been on this Azir for a little while as Sky's made his way back to this top side, level 2 to level 4. Yeah, and actually there was a very smart ward in the brush in top lane, so they are aware that Rengar's already entered lane. Won't be able to see Morgana because the ward is timed out, and we see just trying to help the push, just trying to get this lane reset is MLXG. Yeah, breaking the freeze here on this top side, Crystal. More than able to farm under this turret, though. That rend really helping out a Callista in order to get enough damage down. With the knowledge, you can see on the minimap, Dragon has been started. Even though they're low health members, these are very early, innately tanky melee champions. And they should be able to trade tank very happily and pick up the first Dragon. Yeah, no worries here at all for Snake. And that's the benefit of having, you know, your Maokai there on the bottom side. You can tank up pretty early. Yeah, all the other members using their spells quite liberally. He's going to pick up the passive stacks and just be even more tanky, even more easy. No one falls low. Actually able to re-enter lane after taking a four-minute dragon. Very impressive from Stank. Yeah, not bad. I mean, MLXG is going to answer with a bit of old puppy steel here around the wolf camp. But, of course, dragon going to be worth a little bit more than a couple of wolves. So revert back. We see that the Riftwalk is available on Assassin, so now has the defensive option. Suddenly has to respect Beast that little bit less because he has the secondary uh, gap closer available. But across the map, things just quite quiet. Yeah, and Assassin now has weathered the storm to this level 6. Of course, now has a CS advantage here as well, and Riftwalk going to stop Beast from being able to get anything done. So, I mean, you have to say Snake really won this early game. That's despite the fact that King picked up an early kill, just because with the rotations at level 1, they got Crystal free farm. He didn't have to opt into the difficult early laning matchup against Woosh. Now, he can go back, pick up boots, maybe even more attack speed, make it easy for himself to dodge those Phosphorus Bombs with the Martial Poise and enter lane with a nice item. And at level 1, you know, in those early levels, before you're able to pick up items, will struggle as Callista against Corky, but with items, it becomes much easier to dodge that very predictable phosphorus bomb coming through and they picked up the dragon also with the smart map rotations so early advantage to snake despite the scoreboard favoring king and you can see actually crystal now with a bit of a hard push here towards this top side still only sky available to defend and ella and crystal now looking just to zone away from this experience he's got four levels but certainly no more and despite being in a duo lane for a lot of it Flandre out leveling him significantly level five already and a half yep beast hanging out here as well answering the potential roam to come through from assassin who's spotted out from that pink ward and now continuing just to zone sky away from this lane they are pinging down i mean that red buff is available as beast going to steal that one away. It makes a lot of sense. They have three members in the top of the map. It's actually more risky for him to take his own red buff with the outnumbered uh, map rotations, meaning that the bottom side of the map has less snake members. So they trade red buffs. Very standard, just an extension of the lane top that we've seen from level one. Yeah, I didn't notice the fact that MLXG was already there, taking away that red buff. And it's like, you know, these, these teams have switched junglers here, especially on that red side. Like someone's angry. Someone's saying stay in your lane, even though this is a jungle matchup. But the result, as you say, is even across the board. Yep, actually, Ward going to be used here from Sky, and Beast going to take a hyper proc. Not going to worry about it too much, of course, as he just pops a potion. And Sky wishes for a laning phase, because he's not getting one. No. Although, that being said, I mean, not behind by too much, of course, in this lane sort of situation. Flandre also struggling a little bit in order to get anything, but he's got a catalyst now. That's actually a big pickup. It's a lot of gold. More gold. Oh, than my goodness. Assassin actually getting exhausted. Takes a couple of turret hits here as well as Barker going very aggressive. Now with that Rift Walk still available. And look at Barker just playing this Azir beautifully. And that's why these champions are banned away from him. It's very on point. But the teleport's coming through. Yeah, they just want to go very deep onto Lamb here as well in the top side. Snake get their first kill. It's Crystal that picks it up. Ella actually going to get Fate's called. 
to safety. Wonderful no problem. use of the face call. Excellent juggling of the turret. And Snaker back, Atlas. Snaker playing so smart. The trade tanking. This was the core tenant of their f play in the first couple of weeks. And this might be their first 2-0 to arrest what has been a dismal run of form for Snake. Well, it's very, very early to call. Of course, the gold's still very, very even around this map. Wushin actually has a 6 CS advantage here, just considering the fact that Snake had so many members towards that top side. But you have to think Sky just getting zoned away from everything this game and not going to be the massive gnar that we experienced from Flandre last game. No, he's already pigeonholed himself towards a Hex Drinker, so won't be getting any health pickups for the foreseeable future. At the next Dragon, which of course is going to be super early, second Dragon going to be contested just before the 12 minute mark, potentially going to be a very squishy gnar. Yeah, Crystal already with that Hurricane able to clear out these waves so, so fast. Wishing on the other side does have the sort of two main parts of his Trinity Force yet to pick up that zeal, but another 1,200 gold and that Trinity Force is going to be completed, and we'll see whether this is when King can really start to put some pressure onto the Snake lineup. And so this is patch 5.2, so there hasn't been the little changes to how Callista's passive works, so you're able to hop around just that much more frequently. So even though he doesn't have much movement speed outside the boots. He's going to be able to sidestep the Phosphorus Bomb so often. And of course, the Phage and Sheen works best when you're hitting the Phosphorus Bomb, getting those aggressive trades, maybe orb walking forward as you get the uh, Rage passive out of the Phage. But we see a gank in top. Yeah, there's the bounce being used beautifully here from Sky, but then followed up with a fantastic Cataclysm and Beast able to secure that kill for Flandre. i got to say, you know, we've talked a lot about Barker's champion pool, and okay, he's on his favorite champion here in Azir, but how much more comfortable does Snake seem to play revolving around Beast on either Jarvan or Nunu? Yeah, of course, with true. the Nunu, it's the invasion, it's the denying of resources. With the Jarvan, they're just so on point with their ganks and turret dives. Yeah, and they're just able to use Jarvan for exactly what he's good at, which is locking down a target after they've used all of their mobility spells. And Snake, if they can guarantee kills... They just play with such control around the map. I mean, no one has access to more uncleansable CC in the first few minutes of the game at just level two with the flag and drag than Jarvan. And it just makes their turret diving so, so easy. You can see Wushin actually using this phage quite handily. The extra health being fantastic here, able to sort of weather the storm from Crystal's constant harass here. But you can just watch as Crystal just rends down this lane how much of the lane control he has once again two games in a row, despite the fact that this is almost as strong as a Trinity Force Corky. Phage and, and Sheen are definitely probably the biggest first buy you can have as Corky, barring a full Trinity Force, and still complete lane advantage. Lane control goes to Snake, and this will be a second dragon. Yep, 12 minutes into the game. I mean, sometimes this is going to be the timing for the first dragon, but of course it's the second now for Snake. Some more pushing power to come through from those guys as well, so... Going to be just that much closer to that third movement speed, speed dragon, which is so important here for both sides. And King just can't do anything. They're just sitting back. They're not pushing lanes. They're just hanging back, almost last hitting CS. Of course, Crystal doesn't even lose any minions, barring maybe the one million minion that dies just to creep aggro and can re-enter lane with a second dragon. Happily going to push out the lane. Okay, he's behind a couple CS, but in the grand scheme of things, it means nothing. Yeah, he doesn't mind about that at all, of course. No turrets have fallen down, but that's going to quickly be changed here as Snake rotates through to this mid lane with four members, three of them being melee, but it doesn't matter because there's just no one there who can respond from King. If you're really smart with your rotations against the cast, and again, what can he do? St stood next to the turret, he has very limited wave clear, especially in early levels. The Force Pulse, we'll see how many levels he has in it. It's just the two levels in the Force Pulse. No hope in hell of clearing waves against four members. And they're just going to continue their rotational gameplay, take down those outer turrets. We see Crystal already rotating a little bit. It's going to be hard to push down Corky's turret at this early stage in the game. But you know Snake's game plan. They're going to rotate a few members, four members to each turret, get those outer turrets, and then start smothering King out of the game. Yep, Crystal actually going to be able to take their own red buff here. You can see he's just dancing away. And that was about half of its health with a rend, which is just ridiculous. Going to head back and possibly pick up that BF sword. He wants to be able to get some flat damage here, but he might also opt in to the Vampire Acceptor. We'll see what he has enough money for here as he's just hanging around up. in this base. Just creeping up, 1530 gold when he backs. So picks it up, a nice massive pickup, and suddenly you have to really respect the rend sets in a fight. Oh, yeah, and this is sort of, I mean, doesn't have the lifesteal that's available from that 
bloodthirsty but yet. But I'm going to stop you right there. Look at the front line. He's not going to need lifesteal at this well, early Well, yeah, that's the, the thing. There's not even the sign of an armor item across the king lineup. You cannot 5v5 against Crystal. And we're saying that 14 minutes into the game. And you can barely 5v5 against Snake as it is. I mean, that's where their skill lies as a team here as well. And, I mean, King, they have shown fantastic team fighting abilities. But I just don't think it is anything when you compare it to Snake at their best. And look, let's even say, let's even be generous and say their team fighting approaches Snake's level. I mean, that's maybe what Snake would say in interviews because they do respect this King lineup a lot. Their early game has been completely outmatched. There's no point talking about team fighting when one team's been so far out-rotated, so far out-skirmished in the early game. There's never been late, uh, uh, even late game team fights. And now with the red buff, you know they're going to put multiple members because they know that Corky can't stand up to a red buff Hurricane BF sword Callista, and they want more turrets. Yeah, and Ella, moving around with Crystal here as well. The Fates Call, of course, is going to be available if they want to start anything as far as the turret dive is concerned, but you have to think that Woosh is not going to give them that option, of course. The Corky going to hang well back from this turret, understanding that it's a little bit too hard, and Assassin, he wants this blue buff, but he won't be able to get it. I mean, you have to feel like Assassin and the King Lineup feel a bit like voyeurs watching as games are taken away from them. So close, they feel like they can touch it an influencer, but can they? Oh, actually waiting <laughs> for the Eclipse to proc off there as well as Crystal picks up Lamb. Doesn't find Woosh, though, quickly enough, but it's going to secure that tower, and that's all Snake wanted. They are playing this game so beautifully in a strategic sense. They don't care who they kill as long as they can take a turret. Exactly, they just, unfortunately, King relegated to watching as all their outer turrets fall again. Once again, they look like they have no ideas, and Flandre is going in aggressively. Yeah, there's the flash, there's the Fates Call as well, getting a knock up on a multiple members. Sky now bouncing away, but doesn't get far enough as Crystal picks up another kill. He is so aggressive in this fight. Rocket comes down, Assassin looking for him, but that exhaust was fantastic. Crystal's not even going to die as Assassin now looks for more of the fight. Wushin had that flash available. Ella in a little bit of trouble as the Sand Soldiers come through. Through Flandre misses his Q. MLXG doesn't find the bowler, but he flashes over, and that's going to be Woosh picking up that kill. Snake now on the run, looking to try and get away from King, who have a lot of follow up damage potential, but there's the Emperor's Divide. MLXG going to fall down as the Sand Soldiers attack him. Flandre gets Dark Bound, and Sky bounces over the wall to pick up that kill with a boomerang. And Barker looking to escape from this one. Nice dodge of the boomerang is going to get him to safety. He does, of course, still have that WE combo with the Q, so he can close some distance if he wants to. Yeah, it was a very smart use of the Emperor's Divide, uh, stopping what was already a bit of a hairy situation for Snake. They definitely overdived 15 minutes into the game, tanking the inhibitor turret was Beast, but they back away. They only lose a couple of members, but still, you can see the pressure. That's the big thing to take away. Okay, some of the dives are maybe a bit, uh, a bit overly aggressive, but the pressure being put out from Snake is massive across the map. Just look at these minion waves in top lane and mid, pushing in aggressively. Now a nice big wave in the bottom lane, but someone will go down there and gobble it up. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, King, they do have some decent warding there on their bottom side, wanting to make sure that they don't give Snake another free dragon, but... They might have to as MLXG. He's being aggressed on. He's got the full rage, but it's not going to make any difference as Flandre just teleports in for, for some insurance and to make sure that they pick up this inner turret. You give Snake uh, Jarvan specifically, and that's the reality. 17 minutes in the game, you're not even safe picking up your Gromps, let alone anything else, let alone your major buffs. Snake will contest for everything. As you can see, the next dragon's going to come down. No way that King can get even near that objective. And the outer turrets fall one by one. Yep, Ella gets hit by a Dark Barney, but he's not going to care about it as the inhibitor turret going down below half health here. It's down to about a quarter. Sky now has to watch out. That Black Shield not doing too much. There's the Cataclysm to try and lock down Assassin. Fates call there as well. Crystal picks up the kill onto Assassin. That's a lot of the damage removed. But Crystal a little bit too deep as Wushin not going to get ignited, of course. Barker doesn't have that one. Emperor's Divides here as well as Beast picks up a kill. But Barker falling down low, picks up Woosh, but it's going to be King cleaning up. And that is actually a three for four in favor of King. Okay, Snake need to take a deep breath. They need to realize they're in far too deep at this point. That's a second inhibitor turret they've been tanking, looking for kills. As Beast just walks away with his tail between his legs a little bit. Don't need to go overly aggressive. King do, still do have a very strong late game. But Assassin, importantly, isn't the one picking up the kills. And Sky, he's just picking up his first... Uh, giant spell item finally getting health, but it took 18 minutes for him to pick that item up. Team fight's getting harder for Crystal and Snake as they give items freely to Assassin, but not a big deal.
Yeah, Assassin actually falling down, not picking up any kills, but here's the replay. So we're going to see the replay, and they take the opportunity to go in on Assassin after he uses Riftwalk very aggressively, but wait for Nar to get in. It was a wonderful Nar engage. Able to just use the ultimate. Of course, it wasn't the two or three man stun, but it's still healthy, still alive, finally gets the Nar. And this is, again, the, the health bars are so low. Barker's the only one left. Beast has already left everyone. Again, overly aggressive from Snake, but they just want to try and contest every objective. Yep, but... King. Speaking of contesting objectives, this dragon is most definitely going to be free. And with Assassin in the top side, MLXG basically dying to his own red buff. Snake easily able to take that one down. The movement speed now picked up from that third dragon here for Snake at 19 minutes in the game. You have to think that they're on par for, you know, about a 32 minute fifth dragon this game. That's just a crazy statistic. If they get that, this game will definitely be over. And honestly, there's a chance it might be over sooner than that, Atlas. Just given how strong Snake's performance has been. They continue to control waves. They're stealing away raptors. They're stealing away wolves. There are no safe places for King to farm. Woosh, he has his Trinity Force Sorcerer's shoes. But, I mean, Corky, he looks so different. One, he's been played by Deft, and his team are rotating well, and he's taking down turrets. Perhaps the strongest AD carry in the game, but reactionarily with the items he has, just can't contribute that much unless the overly aggressive dive comes through from Snake. Well, it's also about the timings here as well. This is 20 minutes and he has those items. Now with a um, BF sword on top of it, which is going to mean a lot, but, I mean, you want to have those Sorcerer's Shoes and Trinity Force picked up a little bit earlier than this, you have to think. I mean, the BF sword uh, definitely throws that through the loop a little bit, but I, I agree with you. It's not terrible timing from Woosh, but unfortunately, his team across the map has fallen down and seeded so many objectives that sieging with Corky, it's a dream at this point. It can't happen unless they get a massive team fight win. Yeah, and King, I mean, they have the opportunity to do that fantastic scaling on both their top and mid laners. But you have to think that that is sort of equal in kind. Maokai's just going to become a mortal in the late game. And Barker, with so much consistent damage with his Sand Soldiers, especially when he has that 40% CDR, which is very, very close to now that he has the Sting and Morellonomicon for 30% already, not taking into account runes and masteries here. He's massive attack speed and, of course, just able to move these soldiers at will as well. With the early lane swaps and being forced or building himself into a corner with the Hex Drinker, the issue is that Sky needs to be the front line to deal with Crystal, but has basically no armor against a very, very strong Crystal. Bloodthirst to Hurricane, but the fight might be on. Yeah, Crystal actually getting stunned up by MLXG as he comes in with the thrill of the hunt. Crystal gets exhausted in the end there as well, and that is a beautiful pickup from King Snake. On the run, they have to get out. Of course, no dragon to speak of here as Barker was actually in the top side, managing to get a lot of damage down actually onto that inhibitor turret towards the top. But Snake have to be careful. If they lose Crystal this early in their two-threat comp, there's no way that they're going to really be able to do anything. Far too aggressive was the positioning coming through from Crystal. It was just poor positioning on the part of the MVP leader of the LPL. Because again, you look down the Snake lineup, there's not a lot of peel coming through for Snake. They don't have a lot of peel options, so... For him to be so aggressively positioned is just a mistake. He needs to be hanging behind a couple of his tanks. In terms of peel, they've got a Leona. Leona wants to be engaging, not peeling for Crystal. Yeah, and Maokai wants to do exactly the same thing. Jarvan, the same story. And the way that Snake have been winning these fights is by just engaging so hard onto King that they have to deal with the front line. They can't do any focusing on Crystal because... There's just too much in their face. Yeah, the Zonias perhaps will be a big pickup coming through from Assassin. That will give them a little bit of dive onto Crystal, irregardless of how strong the front line is. But at the moment, doesn't have the goal for that. Actually, it's very, very close. Only about 10 to 60 gold away. He's going to go back and buy that Zonias. That might change the texture of a fight a little bit. But Snake, they're getting down the walls. They're starting the Stranglehold. Double Sightstone and Sweepers coming through. They really want to start contesting for this Baron. Yeah, Snake, they've got the Sentinels roaming through this jungle. You can see they've got so much vision. The Pink Ward on the Baron here as well. They've got a Callista for even more Baron damage. Azir, no slouch in the damage front as well as far as consistent DPS onto this Baron is concerned. And you have to think, Snake, they have an opportunity to pick up a, a Baron here for basically nothing. I mean, King already gave away Baron last game. It looks like they're at threat of doing it again. Down to about 8,000 health now, 6,000. But King, they've altered. They know this is happening. Yeah, does manage to get a bowler in over the top, but you have to think with a Kalista, they're going to easily be able to get this one down. MLXG jumps in, but he's going to die for it. Barker picks up that kill. Sky about to transform, but in the back line of this Baron pit, Beast goes down very low. It's a beautiful 
Nah, into the wall as Crystal gets stunned up. Assassin finds his way over there as well, but Sky eventually falls down. Crystal's still alive. That's the big deal. Assassin coming back over, but he gets exhausted as soon as he gets in. Barker and Crystal, the two threats of the comp, of course, still alive, and that's an ace for Snake. When your tanks fall and the damage dealers lift, this is the reality. No one is tanky enough to deal with Crystal, and he could dance around, put out a lot of damage, and has so much effective lifesteal, over 30% when you consider that the uh, Hurricane Bolts apply lifesteal. They did not even fall dangerously low on the fight, even with the Zonias being completed on Assassin. They're going to push up and keep taking the objectives. Yep, this inhibitor turret definitely going to fall down as Beast finds his way into the fight as well. Bowler not going to find Crystal, of course. So sneaky on this, Callista. You can just bounce around everything. The inhibitor going to fall. Baron taken now as well. An 8,000 gold lead for Snake. Not you know, the same sort of lead that they had in game one and King now with a little bit more of a scaling comp, but you have to think they're definitely on the ropes again. And yeah, not as oppressive a lead. It's not probably going to be the 26-minute game-ending push coming through from Snake just yet, but Beast, he might be caught. Yeah, this might be helping out King here a lot as Beast actually going to use that flag and drag in order to escape. He gets the face of the mountain shield as well from Ella, who is trying to peel for Beast, but buddy, that's five members of King and you're dead. And look, this is the only time that King has looked like they had a window into the game is small positional mistakes coming through from Snake. When Crystal was too aggressive with his position and was caught, it relieved a bit of pressure from, from King as they were in a 5v4 outnumbered situation. The same thing's true here, but unfortunately they've lost the maximum. They've lost the Baron. They've lost their inhibitor turret. Waves are pushing in aggressively towards their base. I'm not really sure how King get back into this game because they've already given away so much and Flandre's popped the righteous glory. Yeah, MLXG, you, he's just dead. Just dead, and that's going to mean that Snake get to pick up their fourth dragon for free as well. Assassin just cares about farming out some minions, trying to get to that huge point on Cassid and wants to avoid stuff before he can really start impacting these fights. Crystal, you can see, bouncing around, has the rend, easily able to take down that dragon. Eight, two, and eight on this Callista. You can understand now why they put this champion at such high priority, because Callista in the hands of Crystal is just so frightening. And Woosh is very similar in terms of kills. Eight, two, and two himself, but... Unfortunately, his front line compared to Snake's front line is night and day. There's nothing yeah. that you can do to compare the two. Look at all the item pickups being completed. Randuin's, Frozen Heart. I've already mentioned the Righteous Glory being completed on their tanks. The tanks on the King side, they're just emergency item pickups. Look at King at MLXG's build. A giant spell building towards a Warmogs and just a Kindle Gem. It's not a lot of resist to speak of whatsoever. Yeah, we haven't spoken about Barker here as well. 5, 2, and 4 has a needlessly large rod on top of the fact that he already has that Rabidon's Death Cap. These Sand Soldiers are ripping through the King lineup, and he's got so much cooldown reduction on top of it as well as Sky takes a pierce to the face as well. Flandre just going to pop that Vengeful Maelstrom, looking to try and maybe tank up some damage, but maybe doesn't want to engage this fight as Crystal again in the front line might get himself caught. He's going to use his QSS just to stop the slow, but it might give King an opportunity, but... Look, as soon as Crystal overextends, Barker's there with the follow-up damage. Absolutely, Barker on the Azir. The scouting report's through. He's pretty good at Azir yep. Atlas. They're waiting for the super minions to push into the base from the middle, and that's the big thing to come by the thing. And look, now that the minions are pushed in, they can start pushing towards this turret. Yeah, and Sky coming back towards this turret. But I have a feeling that this one is most definitely dead. The inhibitor going to be followed down. King not losing any members just yet, and Snake going very, very aggressive. There's the Emperor's Divide just to zone the members of King away from this inhibitor. Barker, he's going to pick up MLXG for the first one, but the double kill to come through from Woosh as they're trying to get the follow-up. Snake are falling down dangerously low. Crystal still here, though, as Assassin trying to kill the main carry for Snake. We'll see exactly whether he can. Now they got the objective. That's the big thing about this push was taking Crystal out died, the objective. Yep. And Crystal, he did perish. Yeah, he did, unfortunately. As you can see, a lot of buffs actually taken here on the side of Snake. A lot of steals going on. Four dragons to zero. One Baron to zero. Snake, I mean, they took the inhibitor down. That's the main thing. But King put up a valiant effort here in this last fight. I mean, the exit kills help pad the stats. Look at these Corky stats. 11, 2, and 3. Looks like he's on the winning team. But unfortunately, he's a bit of a lone hand because he doesn't have the front line anywhere near, as we mentioned, that of Snake's. So all he can really do is pick up some exit kills when Snake gets just a little bit too trigger happy, a little bit too aggressive. But unfortunately, until any semblance of a frontline, even Assassin being an effective frontline happens, uh, those kills, they just mean so little for King. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, the Mercurial Scimitar now being finished up from Crystal as well. That's a whole lot of extra damage in his back pocket. Transforming just the flat 
QSS, build materials. No worries, easy as you like. And this last inhibitor turret, of course, the one that went down the lowest earlier on is what Snake are going to be focusing on now. The Baron up in another minute and a half. And King will see whether they come to contest that one again. But look, double Super Creeps heading towards that bottom side. And the Nexus turrets are going to need to be defended. Sky's there. Of course, that Hyper actually does a lot of damage here to these Creeps just because it does have that percentage health. Not a lot of AoE on this Nar, no. while a mini Nar from who wants to build up to Mega Nar actually early just to give himself a chance to get some ranged wave clear coming through with the boulder toss. Corky helping him out, so they're able to clear waves. This build from Crystal, it does fall off. We have to remember, we have seen late game's crystals corralled by 200, 300, 400 armor tanks. The issue is, is it going to fall off fast enough for King? Are we going to see those big armor item pickups? Okay, if they pick up a lot of these uh, super minion waves crashing into the base, if Snake take their foot off the pedal, maybe there is a potential for Crystal's build to betray himself in the late game, but it doesn't look like the late game's coming anytime soon. That's the issue. They need time, but they have no way really to extend the game themselves. Yeah, it's true. And I mean, you can see already Snake know that they want to just close this game out. 20 seconds until the Baron. They've picked up the Elixirs. Elixir of Iron for Flandre in that top side just to give him the tenacity that he needs. Of course, doesn't have the Mercury Streds, has that Ninja Tabi in order to stop the auto attack damage coming through from you know, the four main damage dealers from um, King who do rely on a lot of auto attacks. So that Ninja Tabi, fantastic pickup, now has the tenacity from the Elixir of Iron. And of course, Crystal, he's got a pot as well. The exclusive vision over the Baron. So they, we already saw there's no vision whatsoever from King towards the Baron. Baron's now live. King, they know what's up, but they just haven't found a way to actually get some aggressive wards there. Yeah, MLXG actually popped his ultimate here as well. He's going to get a black shield, but you can see Beast going so aggressive. There's the Fates call. They take down the red buff just as an incidental, and you can see the members of King just getting torn apart in this fight. Lane with a decent Soul Shackles gets a few stuns, but Barker finds his way in. There's the Emperor's Divide zoning out the members, but Barker going to go down very low. All oh, that Phosphorus Bomb was so incredibly close. It's going to be the Rocket in the end that picks up the kill, but Crystal was just left alone in that back line. Assassin going to have to go back, as is Lamb. And this could be the inhibitor definitely going down, but we'll see whether it's going to be more here from Snake. Crystal is actually in the front line. He actually skipped past the skirmish battle on the side and skipped to try and get some kills. Actually got the kill on the sky, the first kill of that fight. They take down a Nexus turret. You have to think they're going to have just enough, but they're going to rely a lot on Flounder to tank it up if they want to finish the game. They have to be very careful of Assassin, though, whose name sort of betrays what he wants to do in these fights. Get rid of Crystal, who only had Flandre there in order to keep himself alive. And actually, Assassin deciding to build up that Fiendish Codex as his next item. Wants some cooldown reduction. Morello Nomicon is usually a second item if possible. Of course, had to go for the emergency zone as fast as possible to just have a hope of, of assassinating Crystal. With the magic resist he has from the Cure Seminar, still going to be very difficult. But his job in a team fight, as you mentioned, assassinate Crystal. He definitely doesn't have the items to do it. He finishes the Morello Nomicon. It lets him get that second rotation of spells after he comes out of the stasis. But again, he needs a dive buddy. And unfortunately, Sky and MLXG, they're just not strong enough to help him. Yep, and that was the fifth dragon going down as well, Papa Smithy, as you were talking in. 32 minutes. 32 minutes and two seconds. So I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. I was wrong. Off by a whole two seconds, which means that I should probably lose my job at this stage. The Scrying Orb was used into that Baron Pit. As the Snake members now just looking to close this game out. They've taken down the mid lane inhibitor. And Flandre, I mean, he doesn't want to waste any time. He's just hanging out, trying to be a nuisance here in this front line. And now the members of Snake turn up. He flashes forward, gets the Arcane Smash onto Snake. There's the Cataclysm locking down multiple members of King and Barker. And Crystal just tearing through this team. As Crystal actually, as you mentioned, always there in the front line. Fate calls Ella into his death by the looks of things, but Ella likes it. He's going to stay in there. That's another kill for Crystal. Barker picking up MLXG on the back line. That's a quadra, I think, in the end for Crystal. They're going to be able to take down this game and Snake find some form and come back with a 2-0 against King. I love the Flash Twisted fans engaged onto Sky. It sounds like a bad idea, engaging onto the tank, but they just wanted to pick on anyone to force a fight, and you saw the result of it. Absolute carnage coming through from Snake, oh, yeah. taking down King, and it was a welcome return to form at just the right time. Playoffs are just around the corner. What better time to pick up a 2-0, pick up a lot of confidence, all their players, all their carries looking good, and even Lissandra adding to maybe the issue that Barker has with Champion Ball.
Cosmos. Yeah, of course. I mean, tried out a couple of champions yesterday. Didn't look as comfortable on the Lulu Victor, but that Lissandra early on, they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew how to utilize her in their comp, and it was beautiful to see, you know, the multiple roams coming through, making sure they guarantee the kills against a Victor that had, you know, cleanse, flash, so many escape options, and he survived the first one by using both of his summoner spells, and they were right back there to guarantee the kill the next time around, and Snake just looking like they had a game plan and executed it beautifully. And the only consistent through point we can take from that series, you give Beast Jarvan, doesn't matter, even if it's 5.4 with a couple of nerfs, they're so good at skirmishing under oh, turrets, yeah. so aggressive with their invades, and they understand perfectly how to play and juggle aggro around the CC Jarvan provides early. You cannot afford to give a strong skirmishing jungle, jungle to Beast. Okay, after the Nunu, after the Jarvan, maybe his other champions fall off, but he just decides games in the first five to 10 minutes with his Jarvan movement. Yeah, and we haven't even mentioned Crystal's Callista here. It's just so much guaranteed damage. They can rely on that guy to get all the consistent DPS down in these fights, and it's beautiful to see as well. But I like that you mentioned the other members of Snake because that's what really allows Crystal to go off, and it's great to see Snake returning to form. But, ladies and gentlemen, we've still got far more LPL waiting for you after this short break, so don't go anywhere.